Hello everybody, this is Anthony for Investors Undergrounds. Today, I have the honor of speaking with an incredible member within the Investors Underground and trading community, and Mr. Brian Rivera. Brian is an active trader, entrepreneur, military veteran, father, husband, and certified public accountant. He specializes in helping hedge funds and traders simplify their taxes. He's also the CEO and founder of Trader Tax CPA and Trader Files. You can follow him on social media at Trader Tax CPA. Hello, Brian. Thank you for being here and taking the time to speak with me today. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Brian, there's so much that I want to ask about, and I'm sure plenty are going to be tempted to just start talking about taxes immediately. But for our audience, I would love to start by just asking a little bit about yourself and your background. So how did you first get interested in the stock market and trading? Uh, it's a variety of different things, but um, there was a period of time where um, I was working at a big four CPA firm. And we used to always have to go through all this compliance related stuff. And one of those compliance measures were we were not allowed to trade the stocks or the companies that we were auditing their financials. And, you know, normally when someone tells you you can't do something, you have to figure out, you know, why they can't do it. And so that was probably one item that, you know, piqued my interest. And then, um, you know, I had some other people that that came into money that were, you know, my coworkers and, uh, you know, they were gifted stocks at Apple. And I would always hear these conversations, but I never really knew what it was. And so that's kind of what started it. And then um, eventually, you know, when I really started taking it serious, it was me trying to figure out how to make money while I'm also working. And then it eventually, you know, table that into further ventures, investments and stuff like that. So. so did you have a background in finance before you started learning about stocks? Not necessarily. So, you know, with like any 18 year old, I had, you know, no clue what I wanted to do um, once I actually left the house. And so me growing up, my father was in the military. My mom was in the military a little bit. So my path was kind of set to where either A, you know, you, you graduate, go to college or you graduate and join the military. And so for me, I was able to, to get a, a military scholarship to school. I went to a school in Florida, uh, Florida and m University. And so originally I thought my path was graduate, commission as an officer, go travel the world doing the military thing. Um, but then, you know, while I was in school, my interest really started peaking towards the business side of things. And so um, I felt that a general business degree was, you know, kind of jack of all trades, master of none. And so then I fell in love with accounting, specifically because accounting is kind of like the language of business. And so my background was is in accounting, which that is includes corporate accounting, SEC filings, and then obviously taxes. So that's kind of how I got into the whole accounting finance space. And so you're an active trader yourself. What was that process like of learning how to trade? What resources were available to you? And how did you eventually carve out a niche in your trading? What's your trading style like? You know, my trading journey started 2014. Um, and so this was probably a little bit before I think online trading really took off. And so there wasn't a ton of educational resources. There wasn't a lot of stuff uh, out there where you could, you know, just find a mentor or, um, you know, do what you needed to do to um, be successful, at least cut the learning curve down a little bit. And so I don't, I don't want to age myself, but um, what happened is I got into a few of these AOL instant messenger groups. So it was before Discord, before Slack, before all this stuff. And I had some people that I would trade with. And so you know, between our communications on a day-to-day -day basis, there was a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of what's figuring like what works and what's not working. And so that kind of helped the baseline. And then obviously surrounding yourself with other traders who are successful. And so you can take pieces of what they do. And then also it'll encapsulate what you do. Like, I don't think no two traders are the same, but you can take bits and pieces of what they do successfully and then apply it to what you know, you do on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. And do you remember some of your first trades and what <laughs> was that first couple of trades or that first year like for you? Yeah. 
You know, I think with trading, the worst thing that can happen is you're successful early on because you get a false sense of security and that you could develop habits that are not sustainable long term. So the first year, obviously, with like any new trader, there's a lot of ups and downs. Um, there's a lot of wins. There's a lot of losses. And when I first started, you know, I targeted the small cap market uh, specifically, you know, stocks priced between, let's say, 50 cents and maybe fifteen dollars. And when I started, you know, what worked then, I wouldn't say necessarily works now. Um, but what, what I would do is, you know, I would focus on these companies, read their SEC filings, understand the fundamentals. And then that helped me kind of build a thesis against the chart. And then what I would do then is I would short sell those stocks and then cover, you know, a couple of days later, a few weeks later until, you know, they dropped. Nowadays, I probably wouldn't recommend doing that. That's probably suicide. Um, but back then, you know, the, the whole stock locate game was different and, you know, kind of how companies um, are able to produce volume is a lot different. So what I used to do then is not what I do to, uh, today on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so would you say that things are significantly different now in your trading style compared to when you first started, or are you still generally using the same concepts? Yeah. So I think um, I started off in the small cap market and then I slowly tried to open up the playbook. So this was probably maybe 2017, 2018. I think there was a slow period in the small cap space. And that was the first time it hit me where I was like, hey, man, like you're a trader. So you should be able to make money in all types of markets. So it doesn't matter if the market's slow, if it's fast, if it's up, it's down. You need to be able to be successful in any market. And that's when I ventured into uh, understanding how large cap stocks move. So these are going to be, you know, the billion dollar companies. The problem with that, as soon as I ventured into it, I couldn't hit a trade to save my life. So I was making money in small caps, putting it in large caps. And then I got into this, you know, slowly trying to understand how those uh, stocks move. And then once I could figure out how to actually trade those uh, consistently and successfully, then I slowly layered in options on top of that. And so what I do now today is I, I primarily trade options and um, I also trade uh, what's called 1256 contracts. So some people may know them as futures, you know, tickers like ES, uh, SPX. Um, and the primary reason behind that is really tax reasons um, because they get a blended tax rate. Uh, we can get into that later, but that's kind of what I do now um, on a on a day to day basis. I definitely wanted to ask a little bit more about your entrepreneurship, because mm -hmm. in addition to being a trader, you also started a couple businesses. Can you talk <laughs> a little bit about the mission of Trader Tax CPA and Trader Files? Yeah, absolutely. So Trader Tax CPA, you know, what's interesting is, you know, I've, I've been a CPA for, you know, I think since 2010, right? So I'm 13, 14 years now. And um, my intention really was not to serve uh, the trading community. Matter of fact, I was just looking at small businesses, uh, people in kind of my local demographic. Um, but when I fell in love with trading and, and understanding the financial markets, um, I used to be in these chat rooms, these aim rooms, and people would ask me tax questions. And sometimes I would answer them. And then one of my, you know, buddies, um, you know, mentioned to me, he was like, hey, you know, you realize there's not a lot of CPAs out there who understand day trading, what it takes to be a trader, but also understands how to apply that from a tax sense. And so that was kind of the first time someone planted a seed. And, um, you know, I thought about it and I was like, actually, you know what, you're right. And so I was never big on social media. I was never big into marketing, um, but it was necessary to help grow um, the, the tax side of, of the business. And so, so really the mission of Trader Tax CP is to help active day traders navigate the tax uh, tax market or the what's the word, the complexity of taxes, right? A lot of times people only talk to their CPA when they have, they make a ton of money or they lose a ton of money. But either way, you got to figure out how to strategize uh, which best suits your needs. And then Trader Files takes that uh, to the next step, right? So what Trader Files is, it's, it's a software application that helps automate capital gains tax calculations. So, you know, at being a trader, you know, you might have five brokers, 10,000 transactions and trying to figure out your broker reported accurately, you know, how to put this on the IRS tax form. This software solution helps solve that particular problem. Because um, one of the biggest problems, I think, in a service industry is you can't help everybody. You can't, you know, it's just, it's a time thing. You can't help everybody. But software 
allows you to help a lot more people in, in, a, in a bigger reach. And so that's how Trader Files came about. That's excellent. And what would you say are some of the benefits and challenges and maybe even drawbacks of your work? I would say the benefits are I can travel in any city and I know somebody there because <laughs> um, we have, you know, we have clients across all 50 states. Um, and I would say that, you know, it is truly a pleasure to be able to specialize in an area and people regard you as an authority in that space, right? Like you could go see a CPA and he may know a little bit about everything, but if you ask him a specific question about a specific issue, you know, me and my team were able to solve or, or serve that particular um, niche or that type of um, career path. And not a lot of people know about it. So I really enjoy that I'm able to help a select audience of, of traders. Now, some of the drawbacks I think is with any service business, right? You're, you're capped at the amount of time that you can invest in people, right? Because when you're in a service industry, it is very personal. You're in someone's personal finances. You're in, you know, a lot of different things related to that person. And so as you start growing a business, it, it, it actually, it's harder to be effective at scale, right? Because um, everybody needs that individual attention. So the, I would say the drawback is, you know, as you grow, sometimes you may not be able to spend as much time as you would on a particular client or on a particular business. Um, and so, you know, that's probably, a, I would say a drawback, but, you know, now our, our book of business is pretty mature. And so I would say we're pretty selective now on the type of clients that we take on. Like we don't just take everybody and we have a period of time where we allow new business uh, to come on board. Would you give any particular advice to others who might be interested in combining their interest in trading with their skill set for accounting or interest in taxes? Yeah. So if you are, um, let's say you're an accounting student and you love trading, I think that those two skill sets definitely go hand in hand. Um, and if you're passionate about the financial markets, you know, providing a service to people that are in that space, it's a good way to align both your purpose uh, with what you're passionate about. And so if you're, you know, if you're looking for a job, you know, definitely shoot me a DM. Um, you know, we'd love to have you. Um, but yeah, I think, I think any, anytime you can, you can combine those two, it's the perfect marriage. And Brian, how do you balance your trading with your job and your work as a CPA? I could imagine that certain parts of the year, you're a lot more busy than others. <laughs> You know, if you ask my wife, she'd probably say I'm a robot or a machine. Um, you know, I I'd probably give a, a lot of credit to growing up military, going through officer training, going on deployment, doing a lot of things because I live my life like a timeline, like 0500 to 0600. I do this like everything is very systematic. So I, there's no hour that I have in a day that is actually wasted. And so balancing uh, running not only Trader Tax CPA, but I have multiple other businesses that I'm a part of, um, but I'm very deliberate in my time. And so when it's time to trade, I focus on trading. When it's time to focus on the tax business, I focus on it. Um, now, obviously, there's periods of time throughout the year where maybe one business needs more time than the other. So the, the good thing about the tax business, it's very cyclical. So we have our peak time is probably, I'd say, December to April is kind of the, that first push. And then for all our clients that are on extension, we kind of focus on um, doing that throughout the summer. But for any business, you know, I would say that if you're in a business where it doesn't have to be taxes, but if you're in a business where you're the sole operator or you're the owner and you also have a passion for the market, you know, my advice would be is to build up the next layer of leaders in your business because um, that's ultimately going to help free up time, you know, on your plate. And you can use that time to either A, keep scaling that business, or you can keep focusing on becoming better um, as a trader. I wanted to talk a little bit now about taxes. And so I wanted to start sort of with asking you, you know, if you can maybe speak to the audience about the importance of understanding that every trader might be different and their tax situation might be different. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes on social media, you know, you'll hear people give tax advice or tax opinions. And I would just say, you know, obviously look at it as educational in nature. 
don't take it as individualized tax advice because what works for you, what works for me may not necessarily work for the next person. And so if you're ever going to execute some form of tax strategy related to your situation and you haven't done the research and you can't back it up, you know, I would just say consult a professional, uh, uh, consult a CPA, a tax advisor, because uh, ultimately they're going to be able to point you in the right direction and validate what you're thinking. Um, so yeah, you definitely want to keep yourself safe. Okay. And so the first question that I had about taxes was, what are some of the considerations and tax tips that traders should be aware of? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. So I think that for anybody that is new to the market or has been trading for some time, they need to understand there is some guidance that the IRS puts out. It's called IRS Tax Topic 429, which is trader and securities, but you may know it as trader tax status or trader status. Now, I think the baseline level of information that you need to know is that if you are a trader and you trade enough to where you can qualify, then you'll have two main benefits. One is the ability to write off your business expenses. So if you have costs um, associated with your trading, you want to be able to write those things off because ultimately that's going to reduce the amount of taxes you owe. And then the second piece is this may be applicable to some, but not all, is having the ability to use what's called Section 475 mark-to-market accounting. And so I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but those are going to be the two benefits that I think every single trader needs to know when it comes to trader tax status. Okay, thank you. And I know you mentioned benefits. So what are the potential benefits maybe that's write-offs or something else uh, that mm -hmm. traders might be able to qualify for if they do qualify as trader tax status? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a ton of them out there. Um, you know, I can touch on a few of them, probably the most popular ones, but let's just say you're a brand new trader and you find a mentor or you sign up for an educational program. You know, these, these are not free, right? There's a cost associated with you know, education, mentorship, all that good stuff, right? So those costs, if you qualify as a trader, can be deducted against your actual uh, trading-related profits, right? Or let's say you're doing entity structuring where you want to trade under some type of uh, corporate structure. Well, the cost associated with that attorney, that CPA, um, the filing fees, all that good stuff, that can be tax deductible. Uh, a very popular one, especially when I used to trade uh, small cap stocks, is hard to borrow margin interest in stock locate fees. You know, I remember that could run anywhere between 25 to 40 percent of my PL, right? That's a huge cost, but it's also a cost associated with executing that particular strategy. So that is a business deduction. So there's a ton of them out there. Um, I have some blog content out there that you can find. You can check my YouTube channel, but there's a ton of stuff I have out there around some of the things that traders can be done. Okay, great. And would you say that it's important for traders to keep taxes in mind from day one? Or do you think taxes are something that mm -hmm. traders should sort of see as the cost of doing business and just worry about it when it's time uh, for tax yeah, season? So as you level up in business, in trading, and in life, is your income level, you know, level levels up, your wealth levels up, you know, the biggest expense that comes at you is going to be taxes. And so, in my opinion, it always needs to be at the forefront and you need to be ahead of it instead of behind it. You know, so I can't tell you how many times people shoot me an email on April 15th. Hey man, you know, the turbo tax or my CPA says I owe 200 grand. Is there anything I can do? My, my advice was always, you know, after we cross a new year, there's nothing that you can do in terms of tax planning. There's some Hail Marys. There's not a lot you can do. So you always want to be playing offense versus defense when it comes to tax planning. So that's why it's important to have a CPA in your corner or a CPA firm in your corner that helps you as you grow. You know, I've had clients that, you know, when we first started working together, let's say they were break even or maybe they were losing money. But now they're at the point where they're making crazy amounts of money. Right. So every single year, their tax planning and their tax strategy might change a little bit because, you know, we have to make certain tax moves to um, to lower that tax bill, but also help make sure they're building their wealth uh, for the long term. That makes a lot of sense, actually, because maybe we're so focused on our trading, we're not thinking mm -hmm. enough about these other type of, you know, P&L, which could be our future taxes. You know, could you imagine making $2 million in one year 
let's say you live in the state of California, right? Well, you just go ahead and put a 50% haircut on your trading account. And this is before any tax planning, right? So it's very important to say, okay, yeah, I made 2 million, but if, but if you leave with, let's say 1.1 million, and then next year you have a big drawdown in Q1, that's a, that's a huge hit to your trading account, right? So tax planning is key because you want to preserve some of those profits. And have there been instances where you've been able to go on offense with one of your clients and yep. help prevent them having to pay or overpay uh, on yep. their taxes? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, how I view tax planning, it might be different from person to person, right? So there's general things that you can do, retirement accounts, entity structuring, you know, home office. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. But when you're making millions, you know, you really have to think about, okay, what is going to benefit me not only now, but in the future? And so how I look at it is you're going to pay somebody, right? You're going to pay Uncle Sam. Most people don't want to do that. So you, you have two other options now. You can either create housing or create jobs. So you can invest your money in real estate, which could eventually produce tax write-offs um, using stuff like cost segregation studies, Airbnb, short-term rentals. Like there's a lot of stuff you can do in that space, or you can create jobs. So a lot of times people don't realize that you can purchase businesses that are already in place, that have structures in place, that have assets in place that allow you to depreciate those things, right? You, depre you get big write-offs for purchasing businesses and then now there's future cash flow. Like I'll give you an example. I just bought a restaurant. People are like, Brian, what do you know about the restaurant space? I know nothing, but I have an operating partner who does, right? So he executes on a day-to-day -day basis what that restaurant does in terms of you know hiring front of house, back of house, all that stuff. But the deal was structured as an asset purchase. So I bought everything inside of the restaurant and you know the existing structure. Well, I get a big fat tax write-off because all of those are assets that are going to get depreciated. Please don't use this as individualized tax advice, uh, but there is stuff out there that you can do to play offense against your against your overall um, you know, tax situation. That's pretty incredible. And like, like you mentioned, I hope traders don't go out and try to go buy a restaurant. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. It's not for the faint of heart, but you know, I think that um, if you have the right people in place, you've got the right foundation in place, you can be successful at anything. Because obviously you're in the trading space, right? Most people... You'll hear 90% of traders fail, 90% of traders quit, whatever. But if you're in this space for the long haul, you know what it takes to be successful. And because you're successful, now it's time to preserve that wealth. Thank you so much. And I definitely wanted to ask some questions about entities. At what point should traders maybe consider forming an entity for their yep. trading business? And are there differences in terms of whether they start an LLC versus mm -hmm. a corporation? And do you have any suggestions yep. for them? That's a tough question. I get that question a lot, but it all depends on your situation. So I would say an LLC on the surface, I'm going to put it out there. Just because you have an LLC does not mean you're going to save on tax. If you take anything away from this, that does not mean you're going to save. Now, you can use the entity structures, though, to implement certain tax strategies. So using the LLC structure allows you to do a lot of different things, set up deferred comp or cash balance plans set up solo 401ks so that way you can max your retirement, running through the cost of health insurance. Um, I, I can't tell you uh, how, many, how expensive health insurance is being self-employed, um, that you know that's a huge cost, right? So there's a lot of different things you can do inside of the entity structure. Now, there's so many different ways that you can set this up. You can set it up as you know, a single member LLC where it's just you, um, you could set up as a partnership where it's you and your spouse or you and your, you know, you and one of your friends that trade together. Um, you can have a management company and an operating company. Like there's so many ways to skin the cat. And so that's why I always recommend do a consultation to see what works best for you. Could you explain mark to market accounting? Uh, mark to market is known as Section 475. And what mark to market does is it marks your positions as of the end of the trading day to market, meaning if you have a position that's open and you have an unrealized gain, at the end of the day, your gain, whether you sold or not, is gonna be marked to market. So it really only applies on December 31st. So if you're somebody that swing trades and you're a mark to market trader, anything that you have open in your broker, gain or loss is gonna get marked to market as of December 31st. Now, using this, for an active trader is great is because you're in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out all the time. 
And so you don't want to have to worry about wash sales, right? So you elect mark to market. So that way wash sales are not a problem and you don't have to worry about tracking um, uh, what's the word, the complexities of, of wash sales throughout the year. So mark to market is perfect for that. The other thing it's perfect for is I would call it an insurance policy. So let's just say you're a neutral or a seasoned trader and you lose 500 grand in the market. If you lose 500 grand in the market and you are not a mark to market trader, the IRS allows you to write off $3,000 on your taxes against other income, businesses, W-2s, real estate, whatever. You write off three grand. They allow you to carry $497,000 into the next tax year. So if you quit trading, you're going to be writing off $3,000 for the next 200 years, right? So if you are a mark to market trader and that same thing happens, you take that loss and you're able to offset your other income. So if you've paid any tax, now you get a refund of the taxes that you paid. So it's, it's a, and it's insurance policy if something went wrong. You know, we had a lot of clients that did well 2020, 2021, had some drawdowns in 2022. So the mark to market election didn't necessarily help them on the gain side, but it did help them in the years you know, that they lost some, some significant money. That's incredible. Thank you. And I know you had mentioned wash sale. Can you yep. define wash sale for those who don't know what it is? Yeah. You know, anytime you trade a position and you take a loss, right? Let's say you took a loss on Tesla today and then you turn around and trade it tomorrow. So as soon as you open that trade tomorrow, that loss that you took is now disallowed and considered a wash sale because you bought a stock that you took a loss on within a 30 day window. Now that loss is not gone. It's just added to the cost basis on your next trade. So in your next trade, if it's profitable, it could be look, it could look like a loss because your cost base has just gotten bumped up based on the loss that you just took on your last trade. So normally on a day-to-day -day basis, it's actually not a problem. Where it becomes a problem is if this happens across two tax periods. So you got to remember the, the window is 30 days. I usually tell people 31 days, so that way they're overcautious, but it's 30 days. So if I took a loss on December 15th on Tesla, let's say I lost 20 grand. I don't touch Tesla at all. But then on January 1st, I trade Tesla again. That loss I just took gets added to the cost basis on January 1st on the next tax year. So in the current tax year, that 15 grand loss I just took just got moved to another year. So if I'm profitable in other positions, my income might be $15,000 higher than it needs to be. So you know, I'm sure you've probably seen that article running around probably a year or so ago where there was a Robinhood trader where, you know, he made, let's say, 45 grand in the market, but on his taxes, he owed 500,000. And that's because what happened is he traded the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, never stopped trading it. So it didn't give a window of time to allow those wash sales to absorb in the current tax year. Wow. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's complex, but I, I think it does make sense. And I think it makes sense to think about maybe, like you had mentioned, 31 days instead of 30, um, mm -hmm. which, which sort of gets me to my next question. Is the wash sale rule entirely objective or is there some subjectivity to it? Who decides, in other words, um, yeah, what, so what the wash sale is? Yeah, so there is, right? Because the broker requirements and the taxpayer requirements are actually different, right? Because the wash sale is applied based on like kind securities. And so um, so for an individual, right, if you traded the Tesla stock, but you hedged against the Tesla option, right, is that considered similar securities, which the answer for the individual is yes, but for the broker, it is not. So they would calculate it, well, it depend on the broker, but they will calculate it by the actual symbol versus like kind securities. Now, the other thing is, is you could have three brokers. You trade the same thing across three brokers. TD Ameritrade doesn't know what you did at E-Trade or interactive brokers. So when you look at your data together, you need to actually figure out, okay, what are my wash sale requirements across all three? Because each broker does not know. And that is why we created Trader Files because that helps consolidate all that data and then report it uh, accurately. Can you talk a little bit about Trader Files and mm -hmm. some of the benefits of it? Yep. It streamlines tax reporting, right? Because a lot of times people may have a simpler, let's say, tax situation or they can't find a CPA, but they have all these 1099Bs and they don't know how to report them. They need to generate what's called a Form 8949. This is where um, all of your stock transactions get reported. Trader Files will allow you to basically upload these 1099Bs 
all of your brokers, and then it'll spit out your Schedule D and your 8949. All you do is take that information and input it to your tax software, and you're done. Now, it also has a second module where it's like, let's just say you look at your 1099B and you're like, wow, they reported X and I know this is completely wrong. Well, now you can download your trade transactions from your broker in a CSV format. You can upload it into Trader Files and it'll independently calculate what your gain or loss should be on the year. And so if there's a difference, now you go back to your broker and say, hey, broker, um, I think this is what it should be. This is what you're showing. And then now you can start that conversation with your broker. And if you decide or if they decide they're not changing it, now it's on you to prove your tax situation because you're not the broker's not paying tax. You are. So you have to make a decision on whether or not um, you go with what your broker says or you go with what you think an independent third party uh, is producing. That sounds incredible. And that's actually really interesting about uh, comparing broker statements. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you seen in practice that yeah. a broker statement has been incorrect or been inconsistent? You know, I would say the, if I had to throw a percentage out there, I mean, over the years, I've, probably, I've done thousands and thousands of, of returns. Um, and I would say if I had to put a percentage, probably less than 3% of them are, let's say, inaccurate. For the most part, a trader knows what their PL is because they're looking at their equity balance on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure they're using some type of charting, not charting, but uh, journaling software. Um, so they are, they kind of know, right? So that's your first defense. Is this in the ballpark, right? But I would say the percentage is low, but it happens. And so I've had situations for our own clients where this has happened. Like I remember um, maybe about a, a tax season or two ago, I had a client where his 1099B showed that he made $800,000. And obviously anybody would love to make 800,000, but that wasn't the case. And so when we ran this uh, particular situation uh, through our software, we found that they actually double counted every single trade. So he made 400. He didn't make 800. So then we had to, we took, typed up a CPA letter for him to route through his broker and his broker actually adjusted. Um, but again, if you didn't catch that, or if you didn't know that this was the situation, um, then, you know, you'd end up paying tax on 800 versus 400. Now I'm not saying this happens in every scenario, but in this particular scenario, that's actually what, what happened. That sounds like an incredible difference in Absolutely. potential taxes. Uh, one of the questions I had was about paying taxes and the perspective mm -hmm. that a taxpayer, a successful trader might have. You know, what would you say to the trader who's upset that they have so much taxes to pay? They're lamenting uh, how much they have to pay in taxes. Mm hmm. You know, I mean, taxes are a necessary evil, right? Um, they fund a lot of different, you know, federal state programs. And so if you're in a scenario where you have to pay tax, um, you know, I always look at the glass half full, right? Because there's a lot of people that would switch positions with you uh, any day of the week, right? Because if you have to pay tax, it means you're making money. And so, um, you know, I would say that, you know, count yourself fortunate, count yourself blessed that you're in a position where you have to pay tax. Now, it's your job to play offense against that to figure out, okay, what can I do to bring down or lessen that blow? Um, but um, it is a necessary evil for sure. Thank you. I think that's an incredible perspective. Yeah. And, and one of the related questions I had was, why do so many traders consider moving to Puerto Rico? Yeah, so Puerto Rico is a popular destination. One is because it's it's a it's a short flight from the U.S. and it's it's an easy transition. Not a huge, um, you know, they speak you know Spanish in Puerto Rico, but the language barrier. A lot of people, you know, speak speak the language. There's a lot of traders, a lot of hedge funds uh, going in that direction. Um, but the allure around it is 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 um, there's some tax incentives by you going there. So by going to Puerto Rico, establishing permanent residency you know, getting a, a, a place or a permanent place to live, donating to nonprofits. This allows you to pay 0% capital gains on your short-term capital gains or for your trading and investing. And so if you're in the States paying 30 to 50% on your gain, you move somewhere, you put your head down for two to five years, you invest in the local economy, you, you do what you need to do while you're there. Now you just probably doubled or tripled your net worth because you're not paying tax on all these gains that you're you're actually paying. So I'm not an expert in terms of setting up the declaration, but uh, if that's something that interests you, I can put you in contact with uh, some folks that can help you with that setup. 
that sounds like a pretty incredible difference between yeah. paying nearly zero or zero and 30, 40, or maybe even more. Uh, in- yeah, you know, what's interesting is, you know, I have clients that have gone and already come back now. And I have some clients that are in process of going. And so it all depends on what season in life you're in. You know, like there's some people that maybe you don't have a ton of responsibility. You don't have a ton of family. Like there's certain people that I think are right for it. And there's other people that, you know, they like their quality of life. Like if you're used to your Amazon packages coming next day, you know, maybe it might not be the same, you know? So I think it all depends on what season of life, you know, I, you know, so many people put, you know, so much emphasis on emphasis on tax, but I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a balancing act, right? Like it, it all depends on what you want for you and yourself. Yeah. That's incredible. Similar to taxes themselves, this yeah. situation really is, is person to person. Sure. And so one of my questions is, are there any states in the U.S. that are more popular among traders because they offer certain incentives similar to Puerto Rico? Uh, definitely not on the same level as Puerto Rico, but I think that over the last two to three years, you know, me personally, I've seen a lot of shuffling of parts, especially within our clients, um, moving from maybe the bigger known cities, the New York's, the California's, um, the Seattle's, going to places like Texas, uh, Florida. And one is, you know, you, you've already got a, you know, seven to 10% raise just because you're not paying any state income tax. And so if you're used to paying the federal side and the state side, now you can go ahead and reinvest that money towards something else. But it does feel like a pay raise because you don't even have to pay uh, state income tax depending on where you're um, located or where you're migrating to. So I'm definitely seeing a shift um, of people going to these lower tax states for sure. If it's okay with you, Brian, I'd love to go through sort of a lightning round set of questions. Yeah, let's do it. So the first question I have is, what is the quick tax advice that you would give to any new trader out there? You know, quick tax advice, understand tax topic 429, understand trader status, understand that you do have the ability to write off your business expenses and understand 475 mark to market, which wash sale treatment. Um, So if you understand those three things, that is your baseline, that is your foundation, and you can build upon there. But if you miss one of those steps, then um, sometimes you could get yourself in a situation that um, may be hard to reverse. So it's it's better to have a, be- a, a good, strong foundation. What do you consider to be the best piece of trading advice that you've ever heard or ever been given? I always just tell people, I do a lot of consultations. I talk to probably four to 500 unique traders every single year on top of our existing clients. And a lot of times what I can see a commonality is that making money in the market is actually not hard. It's actually very easy. The hardest part is keeping that money is because what happens is you make a hundred bucks, you're like, oh, that's awesome. And you go back to the table the next time you make 500, then you make a thousand, then you make five grand. And as you level up, you want to make sure that as you level up, when you take those drawdowns and you have those lost days, that doesn't actually uh, take out what you've done before. And so I would just say, however you treat 100 is how you're going to treat 1,000. It's how you're going to treat 10,000, 100,000, depending on how big your ceiling is um, in the trading space. But definitely uh, understand that concept. And what do you consider to be your greatest strength as a trader? As a trader? Um, I'm disciplined. You know, I'm a, like I told you earlier, I'm a machine or I'm a robot. And so I'm not one of those people who um, get emotional, you know, in terms of trading. You know, if I miss an opportunity, I miss an opportunity. If I leave something on the table, I left something on the table. If I took a loss, I'm okay with taking the loss and moving on. And so for me, it's just, you know, any day as usual, you know, it's just doing business as needed. So I would just say probably my biggest strength is that I'm very disciplined. Are there any specific technical indicators that you keep on your charts that you prefer? Mm -hmm. One of the the indicators that I use, um, you know, a lot of people like um, the volume weighted average um, VWAP. Um, I use VWAP and I also use pivot points. And so pivot points is something that was explored by floor traders back in the day. And all it is, is a mathematical equation based on the prior day high and low. And so that establishes a midpoint and then it also establishes three to four pivot points based on uh, uh, just math, right? 
And so I use that as well because most of my trading is intraday for the most part. Um, and so I trade off of, you know, the 515 in the daily charts. And so I found that the pivot points for stocks that have momentum um, work really well for what I particularly like to do. Are there any areas of your trading that you would like to improve or expand on? You know, what's funny is I'm at a season right now where um, I've done really well over, let's say, the 2019 to the 2021, 22 range where, you know, I've been able to generate a ton of uh, capital from trading. Right. So all I've done is redeploy that money into um, other areas of my life. So, you know, I've got the software company. I've got other companies that I'm invested in now. And so what's interesting is, you know, you're always focusing on leveling up, leveling up, leveling up but you never sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor. So I'm in a season right now where my kids are growing up, my son plays competitive sports, my daughter's into certain things. And so now I'm at a season now where I spend a lot, a significantly less time than I did before um, in the markets. And that's just because the, there's a season that I'm in right now, but I know that once my kids are gone and, you know, everything is, 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 has gone, you know, by the wayside in terms of, you know, raising my kids, um, you know, there'll be a time where I dedicate more time. So I'm in a season right now where I'm enjoying the fruits of my labor versus trying to, you know, consistently grow, 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 grow. And what do you do to take the stress away from your entrepreneurial work and trading? You know, we definitely do a lot in the community. We're active in our church and we like to pour into people. Um, and then the other thing I personally do is I like to uh, work out. So I try to go to the gym between, you know, four to five days a week, and that is non-negotiable. And so I always just found that, you know, hitting the weights, you know, sweating, doing what you need to do um, helps you sharper to execute within business and it helps you execute in the markets. And so that's just something that I, you know, I enjoy doing. Do you have any advice for traders who might be struggling right now, whether it's a big loss or they're in a trading slump? Mm -hmm. Yeah, two things. One is I would say, you know, avoid the comparison trap. You know, a lot of times, you know, people pay attention to, let's say, social media or what their buddy's telling them. And you may be at, you know, first base while this person, you know, has could be at third base, right? You know, they, they could be a motivation of where you want to be, but avoid the comparison trap and just realize where you're at, what season you're in, and just focus on being the best version of yourself um, that you can be at that point in time, right? Because, you know, a kindergartner versus a senior in high school are two different seasons, right? And so you want to focus on what season you're in and don't shortcut uh, the process for sure. And last question for the audience and those listening and watching who want to learn more about you or maybe even get in touch with you, how can mm -hmm. they do so? You know, the, probably the easiest way would be um, obviously reach out to me on social media. Um, and I have a YouTube channel that um, I put out content around entrepreneurship, personal finance, day trading, taxes. And so, um, yeah, I can be contacted through various uh, social media outlets. Brian, thank you so much for being here and taking the time to talk with me today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. Thanks for watching.